잘 들리는 중 있어요. 네, 혹시 들리지 않거나 뭔가 접속에 문제가 있거나 하면 네, 채팅창이나 이런 거 통해서 말씀해 주시고요. 네, 저는 사실 미술 분야에서 활동을 하는데 오늘 강연 주제와도 밀접한 라보리아 큐브닉스의 제너 페미니즘을 2019년 한국어로 같이 번역을 했어요. 근데 같이 번역한 동료들은 제가 또 참여하고 있기도 한 에디토리얼 컬렉티브 아르, 아그라파 소사이어티의 이제 멤버들이었고요. 저희 웹진 세미나라고 온라인에서 웹진을 운영하고 있는데 여기에 또 아, 라보리아 큐브닉스와 인터뷰를 통해서 어, 오늘 얘기하고 있는 가속주의와 교차되는 네 한자락이죠. 그 제도 페미니즘 얘기를 또 나누기도 했었습니다. 네, 오늘 행사 진행은 7시 40분까지 이 가수카라 책의 두 저자 중에 아, 편집자 중에 한 분이시죠. 로빈 맥케이 씨. 로빈 맥케이 님과 그리고 또 여기 이제 어, 수록된 글의 저자인 에이미 아일랜드 님. 영어 강연이 영어 한국어 순차 통역으로 진행되겠고요. 영어 한국어 순차 통역에는 김정현 님, 갈무리 출판사의 출판사의 김정현 편집자님께서 수고해 주시겠습니다. 그리고 이후 10분 동안 쉬는 시간을 가지도록 하고요. 7시 50분부터 9시까지 약 1시간 이제 조금 넘는 시간 동안 질의응답과 토론으로 이어가겠습니다. 원활한 진행을 위해서 발표자님 빼고는 입장하신 분들은 모두 음소거 상태로 들어오시게 됩니다. 양해 부탁드립니다. 그리고 특별히 오늘 강연문 번역에 이 샵, 가수카라의 저자이신, 아, 역자이신 김우진 선생님께서 어, 지금 시작 10분 전까지 아주 수고를 많이 해주셨어요. 특별한 감사 말씀드리고요. 이 자료는 어, 저희가 화면을 통해서도 공유해드릴 수 있는 한편 또 이메일을 통해서 이미 공유가 된 것으로 알고 있거든요. 그래서 각자 어, 열어보실 수 있는 그런 어, 상황을 통해서 어, 같이 봐주시면 좋을 것 같습니다. 네, 오늘 강연자 소개를 드릴게요. 로빈 맥케이 님은 영국의 철학자이시고 영국 출판사 겸 예술 조직체라고 할수 있는 어바노믹의 대표이십니다. 어바노믹 홈페이지를 찾아보니까 아주 흥미로운 책들이 많더라고요. 그리고 또 골드스미스 런던 대학교에서 연구원으로 일하고 계시고요. 저는 어, 로빈 맥케이 님을 소개하는 이 문장에 되게 호기심을 가지게 되었어요. 그의 연구 관심사가 과학적 지식과 인간의 자발적인 자기 이해 사이의 간극. 그리고 이런 차이를 간극을 해소하려는 철학적 입장들의 미학적, 철학적 결과에 집중하고 계신다고 하셨는데 이 문제가 사실은 샵 가수카라에 모인 이 책들, 아, 글들과 아주 밀접하게 연관되어 있는 문장이라는 생각이 들었습니다. 또 제가 최근에 리서치하다 콜랩스라는 저널을 발견하기도 했는데 이 저널의 편집자시더라고요. 이 저널도 한번 독자 여러분들은 찾아보시면 아주 좋을 것 같아요. 어, 예술 얘기도 많이 남, 담겨있는 저널이라서 흥미롭게 봤습니다. 어, 실물을 본건 아니고 일단 정보만 접하긴 했지만요. 네, 그리고 예술과 철학 글 집필, 집필하시는 것 외에도 바디우나 메이아수, 메이아수 등의 책을 프랑스에서 영어로, 네, 프랑스어에서 영어로도 번역하셨고요. 네, 에이미 아일랜드님은 호주 멜버른에 살고 계시는데, 어, 말하자면 약간 다양한 그런 정체성도 가지고 계신 것 같아요. 저술을 하는 그런 이론가이면서도 어떤 실험 예술을 하는 작가, 창작자로서의 면모도 가지고 계십니다. 이분의 연구는 현대성의 주체성과 테크놀로지 기술에 대한 질문에 초점을 맞추고도 있고요. 어, 말하자면 어, 테크노 유물론적 트랜스페미니스트 콜렉티브라고 할수 있을 텐데 제가 번역하기도 했던 라보리아 큐브닉스의 멤버이시기도 합니다. 네, 라보리아 큐브닉스는 여섯 명의 다국적 여성으로 이루어진 예술가 그룹이고요. 그 제너 페미니즘이 2015년에 발표한 저술입니다. 이 또한 어, 온라인에 굉장히 다양한 언어로 번역된 부분, 무려 13개의 언어로 번역된 부분을 잘 설명하고 있고 그 어, 이론이 퍼져나간 반경도 온라인에서 잘 소개하고 있거든요. 한번 찾아보셔도 좋을 것 같습니다. 그러면 오늘 가장 중요한 책 소개죠. 이어가 볼까 해요. 샵 가속화라는 제가 찾아보니까 2014년에 사실 영어로 먼저 편설, 편집이 돼서 나온 책인데 2014년이 제가 알기로는 그 하우스 데어 쿤스, 아, 그 하우스 데어 쿤스, 
테른데어벨트 베를린 세계문화의 집이라고 하죠. 거기서 이제 한미주의에 관한 컨퍼런스가 있었고 이때 참여했던 뭐 피터 볼펜달이라든가 레자 네가레스티탄이라든가 이런 강연들 내용들 또그 참여자들의 반향들이 굉장히 그 가속주의라든가 아니면은 다른 신주물론에 많은 영향을 미쳤다고 들었거든요. 그래서 그것과 연관될 수 있지 않은 해 아니었나 싶기도 하고요. 아무튼 이 책은 현대 철학의 논란을 불, 불러일으키고 있는 어떤 한 정치 사조와 관련된 대단히 긴급한 텍스트들의 모음집이라고 할수 있습니다. 가속주의적 충동을 추적하면서 어떤 그 이론의 개보, 생각의 개보 같은 걸 제시하는데요. 그 개보들을 좀 말씀드리면 1990년대 뭐 음지 영국에서의 음지 사이버 문화나 잉글랜드, 세이비 플랜트, 에, 어, 해밀턴 그랜트 그리고 CCRU 같은 그 이론과 픽션을 생산했던 그런 문화들을 보여주는 네. 그런 지형을 보여준다고 볼수 있겠고요. <웃음> 이 가속주의자들은 현 시대의 혼란과 두려움 속에서 이제 아래로 질주하기보다는 오히려 가파른 경사면들을 적극적으로 찾아내서 그 오르고자 하는 어떤 문화적 정치적 힘을 보여줬다고도 할수 있다고 합니다. 어, 가속주의를 아직 불안전하게 전개된 어떤 잠재태의 유산이라던가 실천으로 볼 수도 있을 텐데 그것을 되돌아오는데 너무 늦지 않도록 역할을 다할 수 있게끔 이 책이 어, 역할하지 않을까 싶기도 하고요. 어, 그래서 미래성과 기술, 어떤 정치, 그리고 향유, 그리고 자본에 대한 새로운 비판적 역사적 대화를 활성화하는 이샵 가속화라의 책을 편집하신 네, 한 분과 어, 닉, 음. 편집하신 로빈 맥케인인가 그리고 또그 저자이신 에이미 아일랜드님의 오늘 강연을 통해서 더 자세한 이야기를 들을 수 있지 않을까 기대해 봅니다. 네 그러면은 어, 김정현 선생님 통역은 어떻게 어, 바로 이어서 하실까요? 아니면 제가 그냥 로빈 맥케인님 모시겠습니다 하는 대가요. 아네 그러면 로빈 맥케인님의 강연으로 이제 어, 오늘 오늘 시간을 열겠습니다. 어, 모두 박수로 맞이해 주시면 감사하겠습니다. 하이, hey, should we start? Yes, yeah? please. Okay. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming to um, celebrate the translation of Accelerate. Um, this book was published in 2013, so almost, sorry, <laughs> almost 10 years ago now. And it is, of course, a pleasure to see it translated. And we're fascinated to see what kind of impact this might have in Korea and how a Korean and an East Asian accelerationism might differ from a Western one, given that we here in the West, having hosted the explosion of the Industrial Revolution and its aftermath, the West has for some time evidently been slowing down and falling behind. I did actually visit uh, Seoul in 2016 and I met people there who were already interested in the question of accelerationism. And we do have some friends in Korea, including the people who compiled this interesting little book, who are obviously on an accelerationist trip. So uh, why did we, Urbanomic, originally want to publish Accelerate and bring the concept of accelerationism into the foreground? The idea of this book was not to introduce people to some kind of unified position or an accelerationist movement. In fact, there wasn't any such thing at the time. There was no accelerationism. The point was to present a constellation of different positions, which in their interactions and tensions would help to outline a set of problems and trajectories um, of thought that we're, we think are crucial for understanding the contemporary world. So the various texts in the book ask a series of questions that I think are still very, <clears throat> very relevant today. Questions about our relationship to the rapid processes of technological and social change underway across the globe, about whether politics still has a role to play, about intelligence, technology and human agency, and above all, uh, about the future. <clears throat> The way in which this book came about was quite unusual. What we did by collecting these texts was to piece together a history for the concept of accelerationism. 
So in one way, you could say we discovered the history of accelerationism um, by scanning through the 20th century all the way back to the 19th century to Marx and Samuel Butler to find accelerationist texts. Or you could say we invented a history. We selectively um, picked out these texts in order to um, invent a history as a speculative exercise. So we were thinking, what if accelerationism really existed? What if it was really a thing? Since the book has been published, accelerationism has become a thing. It has become a real thing. Surprisingly, it's become quite a mainstream concept here, uh, entering into art, into culture and into politics. And as such, it's subject to many different interpretations. Some of these interpretations are very fruitful, some are less so, and some I think we would both class as being misunderstandings. And there are some very persistent misunderstandings of accelerationism, particularly in the mass media, in the mainstream press. So the result is, I think 10 years later, very few people would, would still class themselves as an accelerationist or say that they're an accelerationist. And so it's interesting, um, part of what we're going to talk about is to reflect on why accelerationism is still seen in some sense as a dangerous idea. Um, in the end, I certainly won't claim, and I don't think anyone can claim that they own the idea of accelerationism. Um, none of us can dictate what is or isn't accelerationism. The word has taken on its own destiny and it's become something real out in the world. All that we can do is tell you about our involvement in its history and our conclusions about what's the most coherent way to think about accelerationism. So accelerationism is an insult. If we can blame accelerationism on one person, then it would have to be the left-wing academic Benjamin Noyes, who first used the term uh, in his 2010 book, The Persistence of the Negative where Noyes identified accelerationism as a trend in post-Marxist, post-structuralist philosophy. And the key text that he's referring to is Gilles Deleuze and Felix Guattari's books on capitalism and schizophrenia, Anti-Oedipus and A Thousand Plateaus, where they ask whether emancipation calls for the destruction of capitalism or whether instead we should, quote, and this is also a quote from Nietzsche, accelerate the process. For Deleuze and Guattari, capitalism consists in a paradoxical tendency. On one hand, it schizophrenically decodes and deterritorializes human society, while on the other hand, it paranoically recodes and reterritorializes it. The basic idea of accelerationism here, then, is that capitalism houses a set of liberatory tendencies which can be accelerated to the point where they transform the social fabric or what it means to be human. And the liberatory tendencies are specifically the decoding and deterritorializing, schizophrenizing tendencies. Accelerationism was never called accelerationism. Uh, Deleuze and Guattari didn't talk about accelerationism. And Benjamin Noyes quite rightly connected their work to a small group of British thinkers in the 1990s who picked up this line of thought and developed it. Um, foremost among them, Nick Land and Sadie Plant. The word accelerationism was never used in this context, um, but it's this group that has become most identified with the term. Their position was that conceptions of the human and human politics, or what Nick Land calls the human security system, are exclusively repressive. They are a drag on the process of the self-development of intelligence and on the planetary mutation that is capitalism, both of which in fact are the same thing because the development of capitalism is the development of intelligence outside of human beings. As Deleuze and Guattari had said, capitalism tends to dissolve hereditary social forms and restrictions. It's not really a social system, it's the negative of all social systems. And capitalism can therefore operate as an engine of exploration into the unknown. It harbors the possibility of escaping from the repressive inheritance of the human. 
And we should note that Nick Land's first book is about Bataille. And I think inherited from Bataille at the core of Land's thought, certainly at this time, there's a reckless and romanticism, romantic, romanticized or romantic desire for abolition. That is a <clears throat> desire to explore the outside of the prison of the human being at all costs. So according to Land, to be on the side of intelligence, to prioritize intelligence, means to totally abandon all caution with respect to the disintegrative processes of capitalism and whatever reprocessing of the human and the planet they might involve. Essentially, it means to let go of your fear of um, what might lie beyond the human as we know it. Meanwhile, Sadie Plant, um, for her part, influenced by post-structuralist feminism, saw in these mechanisms of disintegration and dissolution an emerging alliance between women and machines, both of which had constituted the repressed outside of the patriarchal humanist economy of the subject. Uh, but as well as a, a theoretical position, um, this group also developed st a certain style and the style is very important. In the 90s, the small group that would later become the Cybernetic Culture Research Unit, CCRU, developed a style of writing that tried to collapse theory into the aesthetics of cyberpunk fiction and electronic music, in, particularly the late, in particular the late stages of rave music, dark side, and jungle. They tried to bring together writing with these abstract, synthetic, futuristic, sonic spaces and with the science fiction narratives that were intertwined with them. These um, tracks, this music often included samples from science fiction films like Predator, Terminator. Um, so in this case, writing, it seemed, wasn't a representation or a secondary theorizing writing needed to be a part of the cultural complex, which was at the same time, the site for new conceptualizations of human and inhuman futures. So the idea of accelerationism, or the idea of acceleration was now formulated in a kind of accelerated, libidinal, exciting writing that didn't just describe, but produced the feeling of accelerationism, of acceleration. Um, with this group then, accelerationism becomes the call to participate as fully as possible in the processes that are taking apart the human, a kind of participation in the future before it arrives and in order to accelerate its arrival. Benjamin Noy's fierce criticism of all this was that ultimately it was nothing but uh, an aesthetic and worse, it was an aesthetic that served to promote the neoliberal politics of the time. In particular, in the UK, Margaret Thatcher, Margaret Thatcher's attempt to dismantle um, the social fabric of the UK and replace it with purely capitalist uh, market mechanisms and Reagan in the US doing a similar kind of process. So for noise, it's a kind of abdication of philosophical thought and particularly a betrayal of Marxist thought. Noyes thinks that it's merely a kind of confused championing of capitalism, which in its science fiction aestheticization fatally mistakes the oppression of capital for some kind of liberation. Cap uh, okay. Accelerationism, or rather accelerate, the hashtag accelerate, is a joke. One of the interesting things about the emergence of accelerationism uh, has been a revival of interest in this work of the CCIU and the work of Nick Land. But in fact, I think it worked the other way around because in 2011, Urbanomic published Fang's Noumena, a collection of Nick's writings. And having those texts available, 
undoubtedly had an effect on the emergence of accelerationism as a positive term um, in defiance of Noy's attacks on it. The arrival of Fang Numina turned the works of Nick Land from a derogatory footnote about a brief episode in philosophy into a cultural force in the present. So remember that CCRU and Nick Land, no one had talked about them for 15 years. Their work was completely forgotten at this point. So I think um, otherwise, Noy's mention of accelerationism wouldn't have been noticed. It took on an importance that otherwise it wouldn't have had. Um, and in the wake of this untimely return of Nick Land's work, one of the earliest people to use the term accelerationism and to be a positive advocate of it was Mark Fisher, which may seem surprising given that Mark is best known for his anti-capitalist writing. But Mark was one of the first to use the term accelerationism positively in the text um, Terminated versus Avatar, which is in the book. Following this, between 2011 and 2014, a small group of us on Twitter, as it was then, um, took, up, took up the term accelerationism, and we'd, we would look, spot news items or cultural products or things online that seemed accelerationist to us and post them to each other with this hashtag, hashtag accelerate. And it was just a kind of a joke um, but then it began, began to spread further than this small group. And as jokes often do, it developed into something more. Um, a number of uh, philosophers and thinkers started to seriously develop different lines of thought on accelerationism and argue with each other. And the accelerate hashtag began to take on um, a real consistency. The real turning point was when Nick Cernick and Alex Williams published the Manifesto for Accelerationist Politics, or the MAP, in 2013. And this kickstarted the idea of left accelerationism. This manifesto was a kind of beacon at the time when left wing politics was doing a lot of soul searching, and it became surprisingly popular and broadly read. The Left Accelerationist Manifesto argued that where revolutionary politics had once been passionate about the emancipatory possibilities of technology, the transformation of the human, and the unleashing of productive forces, in the contemporary moment, it seemed to have abandoned that kind of thinking to the neoliberal right. What the manifesto calls for is essentially a reclamation of the ambition and vision that progressive politics once had. It seeks to combat the left's preoccupation with what Cernick and Williams call folk politics. Because we now live in a world that's irreversibly abstract and global. And left politics cannot simply consist in pleas to return to the local, the organic, and the human. Rather than advocating degrowth, progressive left politics must take an affirmative stance towards the reformatting of human society by technology, and the constant process of change and complexification that has taken over the planet. The slogan of a politics that seeks equity and progressive thinking should not be slow down, but speed up. An accelerationist politics, according to the manifesto, would need to build alliances across different practices, design, computation, logistics, information processing, etc., as well as political theory and political debate. Beyond the hopeful horizontalism of movements like Occupy in the US, it would need to be serious about complex organizational strategies to access power. And it would need to operate by means other than the traditional democratic party system. So there's an attempt here, which might seem paradoxical, to meld accelerationism with a more traditional set of concerns about social and political justice. On the one hand, it consists in a sort of realism. The historical product of capitalism must be positively factored into any possible liberatory politics. You can't just pursue a localist agenda against globalization. You can't just organize happenings where you gesture symbolically towards other possible worlds without engaging in concrete questions about the construction of new platforms for trading, communication, etc., and the legacy of the existing ones. 
that sort of activism is just a kind of feel good politics that has no actual impact. So there's a kind of realism here about the about left politics facing up to the aspects of capitalist development that are that are effectively irreversible and indeed have been beneficial. But left accelerationism also refuses a reckless abandonment to the deterritorializing and decoding or reformatting aspects of capitalism. There's an idea in the manifesto for accelerationist politics that we can strategically redeploy and reuse technological advances of capitalism against capitalism. <clears throat> in this way, left accelerationism combats the hopelessness that's sometimes characteristic of left-wing critique. The idea that all of human life is absorbed by capitalism and that there's no way out except by looking backwards dreaming of a miraculous transformation that will enable us to start over from the beginning. In this way, then drawing on the legacy of accelerationism pro provided a way to rethink and reconfigure contemporary left-wing political stances. The extremely difficult task of left accelerationism, however, is to prove that there can be some motor for acceleration other than consumer capitalism. What would that be? Isn't any instrumentalizing of accelerationism just a compromise with the human security system? The question is whether left accelerationism ultimately looks like, in the end, just another species of leftist wishful thinking. Accelerationism has no history yet. With the return of interest in the CCIU and Nick Land and Sadie Plant's work, and with this emergence of left accelerationism and the success of the manifesto when it was published online, it seemed a good idea to publish something. Although we hesitated for a long time, wondering whether it really made sense, whether it was redundant to publish a paper book, since all the discourse on accelerationism so far had been entirely online. So, when we decided to compile this book in 2013, we decided it had to be more than just a compilation of contemporary texts. We wanted to see if we could piece together more coherently a history of accelerationism. Because beyond Benjamin Noyes' brief mention, the history of accelerationism didn't really exist, or it hadn't up to this point. However, as the accelerate trend had emerged, as a constellation of positions coming from various quarters, from theory, political philosophy, art, design. People had often referred back to diverse previous moments, not just the thinkers referred to by noise, Nick Land, Sadie Plant, CCIU, Deleuze and Guattari, but all the way back to Marx himself, Veblen, Shulamith Firestone, Russian Cosmism, so there was this kind of scattered history of moments when accelerationism had appeared briefly and then disappeared, appeared here and then appeared there briefly and disappeared. The first aim of the book then is to connect up these moments, to sketch out this uh, genealogy and to take note of all the different nuances and disagreements possible within a broadly accelerationist position. And above all, to see how at each stage, new accelerationisms tended to adopt some features of their forerunners and reject others. The second aim of the book is to ask what accelerationism could mean now, whether it is or could be a coherent theoretical and political position. And I think it's just as relevant to ask that question today again. Accelerationism is scandalous. The publication of Accelerate helped to promote the idea of accelerationism and it started to become a topic of debate. There ensued, <coughs> there ensued an increasing polarization of accelerationism into what were seen as left and right political strands. And in some way, this was a productive period in which the basic tenets of accelerationism were debated. Left accelerationist concepts such as fully automated luxury communism became current memes and accelerationist ideas, if not the word itself, seem to be entering into left-wing, the thought of left-wing political parties. 
But by 2015, when Nick Cernick and Alex Williams published their book, Inventing the Future, which in essence continued the left accelerationist project, they did not use the word accelerationism at all. Media use of the term had taken another turn. Picking up on a common misunderstanding, think pieces and media reports online started to talk about accelerationism, spreading the idea that it consisted in the doctrine that Capitalism can only be defeated by exacerbating its worst tendencies until the system breaks down, or simply that, in order to make things better, they must first be made worse. Both of those, by the way, are quotes that I took from um, the New York Review of Books this year. So these are still current, current misunderstandings of accelerationism that are perpetuated in the contemporary media. This idea then seemed to flourish in the febrile climate of the culture wars until eventually we were seeing mass media headlines and think tank reports on militant accelerationist subcultures online and quote, the dangerous new ideology of accelerationism. Conflating the accelerationism coined by noise with an unrelated use of the term to refer to a terrorist tactic in a series of neo-Nazi pamphlets mostly penned in the 1980s by a man named James Mason. This conflation of an experimental philosophy joyfully engaged in dismantling the repressive strictures of the human subject, or a doctrine of large scale leftist techno political transformation, with the idea that public acts of violence should be used to accelerate the collapse of decadent liberal social forms with the goal of inciting race war, which is Mason's use of the term, was made possible by this existing misconception that accelerating the process meant making things worse to make them better. And the fact that Nick Land had recently publicly allied himself through neo-reaction with elements of the alt-right. Having turned the concept of accelerationism from an insult to a hashtag tag to a field of thinking and study, and having built a history for it, there was a struggle ahead for anyone who wanted to maintain the word accelerationism and the concepts that had been gathered around it. Should we fight for it? Should we continue to advocate for its complexity and its potential for thinking? Or did it have to be abandoned? No one knows what accelerationism is. This indicates quite well that there is no consensus on what accelerationism is. And that is still the case today. There are, however, a number of common misunderstandings some of which we made an effort to dispel, even in the introduction to the original book, um, along with others that continue to be perpetuated online and lead to both superficial dismissals and celebrations of accelerationism. It's not about accelerating contradictions. It's not about making things worse to make things better. It's not about the singularity. And it's not about speed grasped independent, independently of intensity. What's more, we are all accelerationists. The world continues to accelerate. Mark Fisher remarks in his uh, text very early on that in fact, we're all accelerationists in terms of our actual actions. We might complain about the velocity of contemporary life, but very few of us are really engaged in creating some kind of decelerated alternative. There are calls to return to a simpler, slower way of life. But in fact, humanity at large has clearly opted to plunge further and further into a web of technical mediation that disrupts our relation to ourselves, to each other, to our sense of being human, and renders us economically, politically, personally, and even emotionally and sexually reliant upon machines and networks. We don't even any longer fully understand how these machines work, never mind control them. And their ultimate consequences go beyond even the most uh, extreme imaginative science fiction. Remember that when we published this book in 2013, there was no chat GPT, there was no CRISPR, there's no gene editing, et cetera. It has to be said that 90s accelerationism with its occultism, its uh, ideas of um, electronic addiction, 
the um, network electronic viral plague now seems quite prescient. Accelerationism from this point of view is simply the honest way to understand our current condition and to reflect on our actual participation in the future. We're all living inside an accelerationist science fiction. Accelerationism is and is not a paradox. <clears throat> There's something apparently paradoxical about the very idea of accelerationism being an ism, as if it's something that you could just decide to do. For the classic accelerationism of the CCRU, it was about participating in the future. But if these inhuman processes are inexorably taking place and we as mere humans have no choice in the matter, what does it mean to accelerate the process? There's a kind of temporal paradox here a kind of time loop in which we can access pieces of the future. The future is unevenly distributed, it's a Gibson quote, and put them to work on ourselves now in the present so that the future brings itself about by infecting the present. The crucial thing here is to understand the political role played by fictions and what CCRU called hyperstitions. This is why science fiction has always been important in accelerationism. In Land and CCRU in particular, it was the Terminator series in which an agent from the future returns to the present in order to program themselves into the future. And at this point, it's revealed that at its deepest, perhaps accelerationism ultimately is neither a politics nor an aesthetics, but a philosophy of time, agency, and fate. And then there's the question of intelligence. If we want to be on the side of intelligence, if what we want to do is to tap into future intelligence, bringing it to bear on the present by opening up epistemic, technological and social paths to change, where does intelligence reside? And do we need to take into consideration that as humans, intelligence is not necessarily our friend? The question which is entirely contemporary to this very moment, of course. Does intelligence reside in the blind cyber positive feedback loops of capital, which only seeks to intensify and has no regard for the human, as in Nick Land's work? Or can intelligence be constructed and come forth through a collective practice of rationality and the reorganization of technological means, um, as in Reza Negrostani's work and left accelerationism? Is the future a constantly churning abyss of possibility that we can voluntarily participate in by throwing off dogmatic constraints on our thinking, but can never bring under control for the purposes of a political program? This was the position more recently of unconditional accelerationism, UAC. This then is the philosophical question of accelerationism, the question of futurity, intelligence, politics, and the human. And this brings us to my preface for the Korean edition, in which I address accelerationisms in the plural, because as it should already be clear, accelerationism is not a unified position. It's not one idea any more today than it was 10 years ago. And as I emphasis in my preface to the Korean edition, the most interesting thing I think since the book was published has been the emergence online of many new accelerationisms. The proliferation of these different types of accelerationism is an expression of the collective thinking of a terminally online generation. And it's perhaps it's also for them an antidote to passive doom scrolling. A lot of these accelerationisms, like the original Accelerate hashtag, emerge as a joke or as a meme, but then they take on a, um, a conceptual coherence. Um, and what's been shown in the years since the crisis over the popular meaning of the term accelerationism 
is that accelerationism continues to produce its own discursive history completely independently of any theoretical or academic intervention or concern. It seems like you can generate as many accelerationisms as you want. All you have to do is identify features of the present that seem to indicate unprecedented futures, give in to the vibe and accelerate the process. We could mention among them Laboria Cubonic's Xenofeminist Manifesto, Nix's Gender Accelerationism, a black paper, GAC, Aria Dean's Notes on Black Accelerationism, Vincent Garton and Edmund, Edmund Berger's discussions on Unconditional Accelerationism, UAC, and recent efforts to conceive of an effective accelerationism, EAC, and even acute accelerationism, cute AC or for Korean listeners, agiocelerationism. All of these take the form of um, accelerationisms within a mutating field of thought and cultural production, in which the question of accelerationism enables us to audition alternative versions of the future and continues today to provoke excitement, dread, enthusiasm, and apprehension. Now, in my opinion, this proliferation points to the fundamentally libidinal character of accelerationism, something that can be lost when accelerationism is discussed as if it's a critical theory or an academic topic. Each accelerationism opens up an entry point for participation in the future, and each of these entry points is an index for a sensibility or a perversion of desire a, particularly, a particular stance about what is most intensely futural, which is then accelerated to its ultimate conclusions. Accelerationism champions such obsessive libidinal intensification at the expense of any given image of the human or of nature. And it's therefore always going to be in excess of any reasoned and reasonable management of human affairs. Left accelerationism tried to turn it into a deliberative, responsible, and constructive politics. But today, even its advocates have given up on the word accelerationism and have instead turned to party politics and reform. In contrast, what we see today is the spontaneous emergence of online microcultures, which are not only theorizing, but simply doing accelerationism. And it's worth, worth remarking that this emergence of accelerationisms often happens in communities who have been in one way or another written out of the narrative of being human and who instead of protesting decide to accept and accelerate this and i think that's where we are today with accelerationism thanks for listening <laughs> 네, 열 개의 제목을 통해서 오늘날의 가속주의가 어떤 형태, 어떤 문제들을 제기하고 있는지를 두 분, 로빈 맥케이닝과 에이미 알렌드님의 교차로 들어봤습니다. 두 분께서 함께 해주셔서 더 흥미로워진 강연이었던 것 같고요. 감사드리고요. 그러면 아직 끝난 게 아닙니다. 지금 7시 44분인데요. 10분 정도 쉬는 시간을 갖고 어, 7시 54분, 네, 55분 정각에 시작하겠습니다.